My name is Dr. Jinian Tan. I'm a board certified equine internal medicine specialist and instructor at the University of Calgary Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. I graduated from Cornell University in 2005, completed my large animal medicine residency in 2008, and have spent the last 10 years in both specialty and ambulatory practice. Prior to my current role in academia, I spent time in private practice mostly, and including owning my own clinic for five years. I would like to thank Equestrian Canada for the opportunity to speak with you today. And without further delay, let's begin our webinar on biosecurity. I wanted to start off with a few questions for you. First of all, I wanted to ask how many of you have dealt with an outbreak on a farm before? On your upper menu bar on the very right, there's the ability to raise your hand. If you could raise your hand, if you have dealt with an outbreak on a farm before. Uh, looks like most of you. So six of you have dealt with an outbreak before. And now if you can click on that same button to lower your hand, we can use this utility in the future. Now I want you to think about that outbreak. And do you feel like you caught what was happening early enough? Next, I'd like you to think about that outbreak. And as a veterinarian, were you confident in the protocols you put in place for that particular barn situation? Were you happy with the client compliance? Were the clients happy? Or did you have quite a few phone calls to your office during that time? Today, I would like us to discuss some of these issues. First off, we will start by discussing biosecurity, what it is, and why it's relevant to us. Next, we'll review what we think of as kind of the top infectious diseases we deal with with horses. Next, we'll discuss a veterinary biosecurity plan and what to do in response to an outbreak. Finally, we'll discuss the client biosecurity plan, including the CFIA standard, and we will conclude the presentation with some time for questions. Now, beginning with our introduction to biosecurity. What is the definition of it? It is a set of practices used to minimize the transmission of pathogens and pests in animal and plant populations. This includes their introduction, their spread within populations, and their release, otherwise known as bioexclusion biomanagement, and biocontainment. Now, is there an issue? The 2008 survey performed by Benedict et al. showed that there were 38 veterinary teaching hospitals, and he spoke with the hospital director of each of these AVMA accredited veterinary teaching hospitals throughout the world. He found that 82% of these hospitals reported nosocomial outbreaks in the last five years, and half of them had experienced zoonotic infections in the last two years. Almost half of these hospitals had experienced more than one outbreak, and almost 60% had had to restrict patient admission to mitigate these issues. In fact, about a third of these had closed sections of the facility to mitigate the issues. And I want to ask you, how many of these veterinary teaching hospitals in percentage do you think believed they ranked in the top 10% in infection control based on these statistics? Please go ahead and type your answers into the chat at the bottom right of your screen. I've got a 90%, a 50%. 180. Any other guesses? All right. Well, you are all right on in the fact that it's a quite high percentage of hospitals that believed that they ranked in the top 10% of infection control, despite the fact that they had experienced so many outbreaks. So 40% of these schools actually believed they ranked in the top 10%, despite having nosocomial outbreaks and having to close sections of their facility. 
Now another example of is there an issue is the 2004 Salmonella Newport outbreak at University of Pennsylvania. Now I'd like you to guess what the fatality rate was and what the financial loss was. Can you guess a percentage in terms of fatality rate and how much money you think that this may have cost the University of Pennsylvania at that time? Again, you can use the everyone chat at the bottom right of your screen. And just a reminder to mute your line using star six. So I've got a guess of 5% fatality rate with 100,000 financial loss. I've got another estimate at 2% and a $200,000 loss. So I can tell you that it was a lot higher than that. So we actually had a fatality rate of 36% uh, among 61 affected animals. And it resulted in the financial loss of $4.1 million to the University of Pennsylvania. At the time, a passive infection control program was identified as a major player in this outbreak, including lack of a biosecurity officer, passive surveillance, poor enforcement of protocols, lack of a centralized database, lack of the ability to adapt in response to new threats, lack of risk stratification, of housing and lack of explicit guidelines for barrier precautions other than simply using the term isolation. Now that was back in 2004, so I want you to think about what would a similar outbreak cost today? I can tell you that back in 2002, the cost of a West Nile virus outbreak to North Dakota was $1.5 million to horse owners and $1.9 million to the government. And many of you may know that equine influenza is not is, um, completely eradicated from Australia, but back in 2007, they had an equine influenza outbreak and that cost them billions. So I want you to think about what effect would this have on your small business as a veterinarian? And would it be possible to weather that storm? Now, those were some statistics on larger teaching hospitals. And I want to bring this back to those of you who don't practice within a clinic setting and who practice in an ambulatory setting. So in a survey of boarding facilities in Colorado, only 50% of these facilities isolated new horses and only 6.6% .6 isolated returning resident horses. Of operations with greater than five residents, 78%, so almost 80%, have non-resident horses arriving on the farm. So take this picture that we see on the bottom as an example of what many horse owners would perceive as an outstanding facility. Can anyone tell me using their chat if there are any biosecurity risks associated with what you see in this picture? All right, so I've got horse-to-horse -horse contact lots of open nose to nose between horses. Okay, so you guys are absolutely right. When you look at this picture, you can see that even though it's a beautiful facility and it looks incredibly clean, we have bars on top for the dorsal half basically of all these stalls and the ability to have nose to nose contact not only with their neighbors, but also notice that pony that's tied to a stall in the middle of the hallway. And notice how that pony could have nose-to-nose -nose contact, not only with the horse whose stall it's tied to, but any of the neighboring horses and anyone who would pass by. And someone pointed out too, that where is the quarantine space? And hopefully that they have one. All right, so here is a diagram from the CFIA. And in this case, I just want to point out that our role in minimizing transmission of contagious diseases affects the health status of the Canadian national herd as a whole, allowing us to maintain a country that is eligible to export horses throughout the world. Further, we play a role in the protection of public health and costs to the equine industry. So you can see in this diagram, it shows how the individual horse affects the entire herd, affecting our entire farm and facility which then is actually, which we rarely think about, 
a part of a provincial and national herd, which is then again part of the international herd. Now, do we have any questions on biosecurity before we move on to the infectious disease review? Great. So I'm going to cover what I think of as the big three, which are the three more contagious, more potentially zoonotic, more potentially um, causing some financial and extreme repercussions in terms of their transmissibility. So we are going to start off with a review of Salmonella. It's a gram-negative facultative anaerobic bacterium with the route of transmission being fecal-oral. The clinical consequences are four potential types. One is as an inapparent infection or a carrier of sorts. The second is a syndrome of depression, fever, anorexia, and neutropenia without diarrhea or colic. And I know most of us don't think of this presentation of Salmonella, but I can tell you from working at a teaching hospital quite a number of our horses that we see have depression, fever, anorexia when they come in and we end up culturing them positive for salmonella. We have also had healthy animals come in for arthroscopies and other elective procedures where if we collect routine samples as they enter the hospital, we'll sometimes find salmonella in those horses as they have entered the hospital. The third type is the type that we think of most often, enterocolitis with diarrhea. And finally, we have septicemia with or without diarrhea, which can occur in foals. Who is susceptible? In general, we have about 0.8% shedding in the general population. However, note that this can increase in various types of illness with horses it can increase to up to 13% in horses with gastrointestinal disease. It increases when we have large densities of horses, for example, at vet hospitals and breeding farms. It increases when horses are treated with antimicrobials and increases in horses with colic. So I want you to think about how many horses do you see every week that have colic? How many horses do you see every week that are on antimicrobials? And how often in a week do you set foot on breeding farms, which have immunologically naive neonates, as well as a higher density of horses? In terms of shedding, it begins three to five days after inoculation, and a third of horses shed for up to 30 days. It tends to be quite environmentally persistent, especially in unsealed concrete and wood. In terms of diagnosis, I typically collect a minimum database, a CBC and chemistry panel. I will try to take three to five fecal cultures 12 to 24 hours apart. Now I know many of you are familiar with the Salmonella PCR and many of you are inclined to use it. It is a good test. Um, however, be careful with the test because it is um, inact so DNA of Salmonella is inactivated by bleach and formaldehyde, and therefore you can get false negatives with PCR. You can also get false positives because it detects DNA, whether alive or dead, potentially, and therefore you may have a higher number of false positives with PCR than with fecal cultures. So the gold standard is still fecal cultures because it can be somewhat difficult to culture in that it's transiently shed and also um, the amount can vary within a fecal sample. It typically takes three to five fecal cultures to obtain a positive or negative. And formed feces is more likely to result in a positive culture. If you think about your horses with a great deal of liquid diarrhea, that typically settles down underneath the shavings and can be somewhat difficult to collect. Now those feces have a low concentration of everything, including salmonella. It's also tempting in those cases with the liquid diarrhea to take a rectal swab rather than fecal sample just because it's easier to do. But I can tell you the rectal swabs are also less likely to obtain a positive than a fecal sample. And finally, I want to mention what we call the Swiffer test, which is when we are culturing our environment for organisms, Typically, if you think kind of 
um, back in the day, most of us would just take cultures of each different area using a culture swab. Now you can imagine that can be very time intensive and also may not pick up a whole lot. So what I typically recommend when doing environmental sampling for salmonella is to use a Swiffer and use this electrostatic uh, basically piece of uh, cotton to uh, wipe across all the surfaces of the stall, for example. And culture that, I just simply put it in a Ziploc bag and send that off for culture. And that is proven to be more sensitive in terms of detection of salmonella than anything else. Typically around cracks or drains where it's not easy to get a Swiffer in, I will use a swab for those. The next thing I want to talk about in terms of tips and tricks for biosecurity for salmonella is the fact that everything should be cleaned before disinfected. We will return back to this as we talk about biosecurity measures for the veterinarian, but I want to point out that when we have a lot of organic debris, you know, shavings and diarrhea, potentially fecal material from salmonella, we can't expect that simply dipping for example, a fecal ball into bleach or into any other disinfectant will actually disinfect that fecal ball. And so on the same note, if we go ahead and step into a wet stall, so that's that picture on the left here, I have a simulation where I filled shavings with what is kind of what a liquid diarrhea kind of wet stall would be like, and I filled it with so it's wet shavings with glow germ in it. So glow germ is a material that fluoresces in black light. And so that is simulating salmonella in this case. So you can see that stepping into this shavings in the stall will kick up quite a bit of shavings on top of your boot, typically when you're dealing with that horse. I then stepped into a foot bath. This is a Vercon foot bath with my boot on. And you can see that all a lot of the shavings have now come off of the lower area of my boot. But I didn't clean my boot before placing it into the disinfectant. So you can see the end result here on the right hand side. You can see the glow germ appears as the purple. So that's the equivalent of salmonella in this case. So you can see that I have not only retained a great deal of organic debris with a lot of purple on it, all that area below the shavings where I had actually dipped into Vercon is lighting up purple. So as a result of this, I don't tend, I don't recommend stepping directly from a stall wearing a rubber boot into a boot dip and expect that to make a great deal of difference. Ideally, in order for a boot dip to be effective, you would have to clean off all the organic debris and all the shavings off of it before stepping in. Um, and because this is not very, um, you know, it would be difficult to do in a real life situation to get rid of all that debris before stepping in the boot dip, what I usually recommend is then to use disposable boot covers instead, so you don't rely on boot dips. In terms of statistics, we know that peroxygen compounds such as Vercon decrease bacterial loads um, from boot dipping by 67 to 78 percent. We know that bleach is inactivated by organic material, and we know that quaternary ammonium compounds such as Rocal are ineffective foot bath disinfectants. But if we were to just step into the foot dip and expect Vercon to decrease our bacterial load by 75%, would you then be comfortable walking into a neonate stall, for example, with those boots on? So I can't emphasize enough the importance of using personal protective equipment that is disposable or able to be left in that area. And as in this diagram, I don't recommend using the foot dip as the primary source. And we will uh, talk about personal protective equipment later on in this presentation, but basically taking off your boot covers and then stepping in the foot bath as a secondary barrier precaution would be preferred. And note again that salmonella is destroyed by direct sunlight, but it can live for a long time in soil, bedding, and stall walls. It can also live for a very long time on water buckets, drains, cracks, and stomach tubes and pumps. And so keep in mind to clean and then disinfect each one of these items when you have had a positive salmonella culture. 
Do we have any questions on Salmonella before we move on to the second of the three equine herpes virus? So I want, what I want to ask of you is for equine herpes virus, would you typically expect to see a horse such as the one on the left, dog sitting, ataxic, dribbling urine, um, hind end paresis, or would you typically see a depressed looking horse? If you can type in your chat, let me know what you think. Depressed horse I have, depressed. All right, well, I agree with you on the depressed horse, and we will discuss this on the next slide. So equine herpes virus one is a DNA virus. It's transmitted directly and indirectly through infectious nasal secretions, aborted fetuses, placenta, and placental fluids. Now this can be transmitted via aerosol with up to 30 foot range. It has three potential clinical consequences. So the most common is respiratory disease with fever, rhinotracheitis, and tracheobronchitis. In 50% will have abortion, and neurologic disease really only in about 10% of these horses, meaning that you were right on when you said the most common presentation for equine herpes virus is going to be the depressed horse, who's probably febrile and probably has some respiratory signs. A little more on the neurologic disease, the signs occur about six to 10 days post-infection. Typically, this will happen in a horse that has a history of either itself or the herd having upper respiratory disease, including fever, potentially just inappetence would have been noted across the barn, or maybe people would have noted some edema of the limbs or the lower areas of the abdomen. Now, some horses are predisposed, such as those that are pregnant, those that are older, and foals who are nursing. In terms of pathophysiology, it is transmitted via the respiratory tract. You then get viremia, so a high virus load throughout your bloodstream, and that results in vasculitis and thrombosis of arterioles in the central nervous system. This leads to hypoxic degeneration and necrosis of mostly white matter. Who is susceptible? It is ubiquitous in its latent form, being up to 54% prevalent in thoroughbreds in Kentucky. Individual susceptibility factors include age, immune status, and pregnancy status, whereas external predisposing factors are virus strain, stress, transport, and overcrowding. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because that is your common presentation of stress, transport, and overcrowding in a horse show situation. In terms of shedding, it takes about a two to 10 day incubation period, sheds for seven to 10 days. And we have recently increased the biosecurity isolation guideline from 21 days to 28 days because it is known to shed for up to that period of time. It's infective for 14 days in the environment and one month on horse hair. So what I wanna to bring to light is the numbers that we just discussed in terms of incubation time before shedding, before viremia, and now before fever. This is a study performed by Hussey et al. in 2013 when they inoculated equine herpes virus into horses to induce chorioretinitis. So you can see that fever and shedding occurred in these horses at approximately one day post inoculation. So they begin shedding as soon as they have a fever, basically. Now it's a couple more days later before they exhibit viremia, so the virus in their bloodstream, between days four and nine, according to this chart. Now I wanna point out that neurologic signs in this experiment was not detected until day 10 after the infection. So think about how uh, this highlights the importance of vigilance as relating to fevers because this horse has been shedding and exhibiting fever from day one, yet not exhibiting those neurologic signs as people think of as classic as equine herpes virus until day 10. So this highlights the importance of early detection and potentially submitting both nasal swabs and serology 
for equine herpes virus in cases with high suspicion. Now the diagnosis gold standard is virus culture and isolation. Now for any of us who have submitted for virus culture and isolation, it can take some time. So we're looking at a few days potentially, and if there's not a lot of virus load, we're looking at almost potentially in some of my cases weeks. And so although this is the gold standard, most of us will rely on PCR testing, which is proven to not only have a very fast turnaround time, but to have high sensitivity and specificity. In terms of tips for you as a practitioner, nasal swabs do detect equine herpes virus better than nasopharyngeal swabs. And a six inch polyester or nylon swab would be best, such as that pictured um, in the PowerPoint. Now I wanna discuss the different strains of equine herpes virus. There's the neuropathic strain, so the D752 genotype, that we have had a great deal in the news in the last 10 plus years. And that's because of its association with equine herpes virus myeloencephalopathy and its higher morbidity and mortality. But I wanna point out too that there's the wild type strain, N752, which, exhibit, which existed previously to our greater detection recently of D752. Now, many of us will submit um, our nasal swabs to different laboratories such as IDEX, and they'll screen for a number of different things, and they'll come back with a result, such as positive for wild type strain N752. Now, many of you may be inclined to say, oh, wild type N752, that's not the serious strain. That's not a big deal. However, I want to point out that the wild type accounts for 15 to 25 percent of neurological outbreaks. Therefore, it is every bit as important as D752. So any EHV1 strain with neurological signs should result in strict infection control because that would be EHM. In terms of biosecurity considerations, maintaining a 30-foot distance is important. We discussed how quarantine can be lifted after 28 days. There is a shortcut of 14 days if we have negative testing of PCR for two to four consecutive days. And pregnant mares should be isolated for the entire duration of their gestation. In terms of general biosecurity, separating pregnant mares is a good, is a good idea due to their higher risk and vaccinating is a good idea as well. Um, I'll refer you to the EHV consensus statement um, regarding vaccinating um, during an outbreak or not. I, there's a little controversy over that in terms of a potential immune-mediated pathogenesis, yet um, there have been no increase in um, cases of EHV observed as a result of vaccinating during an outbreak. Um, but certainly vaccinating horses for equine herpes virus with one of the recommended vaccines by AAP could help with our general prevention. Do we have any questions regarding equine herpes virus before we talk about our third and last infectious disease strangles? Okay. So we are mostly familiar with Streptococcus equi subspecies equi. It's gram positive and beta hemolytic. Um, the route of transmission is through direct and indirect contact with nasal ocular lymph node secretions and discharges. There are three clinical consequences, the subclinical carriers, and then those that have just fever, pharyngitis, and nasal discharge, which is probably the most common presentation of strangles. And finally, we have what we think of classically as the presentation for strangles, which is lymphadenopathy, dysphagia, respiratory distress, and pain. Who is susceptible? I couldn't find any prevalent studies within North America, but we know that it's about 6% at least in Brazil. It's mostly young horses who are susceptible. Carriers can harbor it for up to three plus years. And note that it does have zoonotic considerations and has been reported to affect a couple of um, immunocompromised humans in different case reports and has affected camels potentially as well has a three to 14 day incubation period and sheds for up to three to six weeks. Now note that there is a study um, that shows environmental persistence up to two months on wood and up to 48 days on glass or wood at room temperature. Now I want you to interpret this study with caution since it was an in vitro study. 
Streptococcus equi is sensitive to the bactericins from environmental bacteria, so it doesn't tend to survive with other bacteria present. So this study may not apply to field conditions. The diagnosis, the gold standard, is culture. As many of you know, three consecutive weekly cultures, if those are negative, would be our definition of a horse negative for strangles. Now, many of us perform PCR as well. I typically recommend doing this simultaneous as the culture because it can result in false positives in that it doesn't distinguish between dead and alive. And false negatives can actually occur. So I have had horses that cultured positive, but had a negative PCR result. And this is potentially due to polymerase inhibitors or abundant organism. Note that culture can also be negative in the first 24 to 48 hours after fever. So you can increase sensitivity basically through repeated testing or through guttural pouch lavage. In terms of biosecurity considerations, I just want to highlight that we should isolate the compost for manure and waste feed. Now that's something a lot of us don't think about. Um, and also pastures should be rested for four weeks. Also water troughs are a potentially great area for nasal discharge and different uh, fluids to stay. And so daily disinfection is important. Now I want you to take a look at these two pictures that I have up here. And they were actually pictures sent to me by a client after I had trained them on isolation. And they were quite proud of their biosecurity considerations. And can you see any problem with these pictures though? You can actually see that they are holding everything with bare hands without the gloves. Um, so not something I actually trained them to do, but an example of how client compliance can fall through despite, you know, very diligent training and uh, written materials. Do we have any questions on these infectious diseases before I discuss how to create a biosecurity program for yourselves? Okay. So why do we have a program for ourselves? Well, you can see in this picture, that's probably an example of a normal day for you, where you could go to a farm where there's not many horses on the left-hand side. You could go to one where they have an indoor-outdoor situation and there's a couple of different animals. And then you can go to a busy show barn or even a state fair situation on the right hand side where you're seeing a lot of different horses. So throughout the day, you're seeing so many different horses. How do you make sure you're protecting them? Infection control programs can result in a 32% decrease in nosocomial infections. And we know that passive control programs where you basically wait for a problem to happen can create an illusion of safety and was a factor in the University of Pennsylvania salmonella outbreak. Now I have a question here regarding strangles. Are consecutive cultures as satisfactory as a guttural pouch flush? Yes, I would say taking three consecutive samples, and typically weekly is what we recommend, is completely satisfactory according to the ACVIM consensus statement. If we wanted to pick up as much organism as possible, then guttural pouch flushes are ideal, but the three negative cultures from swabs is perfectly acceptable. Okay, in terms of creating a veterinary biosecurity program for yourself, I recommend taking the seven step hazard analysis and critical control point program. And this was described by Dr. Morley. So step one is to list out potential threats. And basically I try to rank these from highest risk and most transmissible to lowest risk and least transmissible. For example, a general equine practitioner might recognize salmonella to be of greatest risk followed by rabies, equine herpes virus, streptococcus equi, methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus, and equine influenza. Next would be critical control points, which we will discuss later. Um, you basically identify points at which a control could be applied and hazard prevented. So those are critical control points. You describe potential corrective actions considering the method of transmission of the infectious agent in question and how to prevent that transmission from occurring. An example of number two would be washing your hands in between farm calls or disinfecting your nasogastric tube after each colic case or 
if you're like myself and you like to bring a tote around with you to each barn you go to to carry your stethoscope and all your different uh, needles and drugs and syringes, cleaning and disinfecting your most commonly used tote once daily. In number three, you would establish critical limits, which means from a procedural and surveillance perspective, you would institute some policies, for example, a policy of zero tolerance for lack of compliance to any formal written documents that you have, if you have multiple staff and associate vets, and also a critical level at which an increase in positive strangles would result in an alert for you and a biosecurity review. In step four, you would identify critical control point monitoring requirements like how will you do surveillance? Will you require random sampling of shoes or nasogastric tubes for salmonella every month, every couple of months? In step five, you would establish some corrective actions when a critical limit is exceeded, some sort of penalty system. Um, for example, at one of the hospitals I worked at, I started a biosecurity protocol where anyone who violated protocol um, would actually buy pizza or treats for the staff on the following day. And finally, monitoring surveillance data actively would be important, and thus it would include, for example, a quarterly meeting or report reviewing surveillance data and reviewing incidents of nosocomial disease and protocols. Finally, we would want to formalize these procedures in writing in the form of biosecurity manuals and incident reports. This data could be used and archived so it could be easily searched. Now I want to get through some examples of all these different things. So step one, where you list out potential threats. Um, this would be, for example, saying, I will place all horses under isolation protocol when they have a fever, when they have clinical signs consistent with equine herpes virus, such as fever preceding neurological signs, if they have neurological signs consistent with rabies, such as behavioral changes, blindness, ataxia, fever, hypersalivation, difficulty swallowing, etc. We would isolate all horses when they have diarrhea. And we would isolate all horses when they have vesicular lesions on their coronary band or oral mucosa, uh, similar to vesicular stomatitis lesions. Now I want to discuss some of those critical control points a little bit further. So one example is getting the call. So as an ambulatory veterinarian, we're mobilized when we get that call, right? But what are things that we can do to prevent a biosecurity issue from happening? I can tell you um, in my practice, I have trained my receptionist that if she got the call and for example, they said that the horse had diarrhea, I immediately had a list of questions for her to ask them pertaining to that diarrhea and basically um, alerting me as to whether or not I should be donning personal protective equipment and following biosecurity protocols as soon as I got there. Now, I also had my receptionist trained that if she got a phone call, for example, about a horse who was depressed and listless, she would then ask the client if they had the ability to take temperature and to call back if there was a fever. And that way, again, we could institute protocols before even arriving on the farm. So think about the different things you could do from the phone call on. Next step would be arriving at the farm. That's another critical control point. So I can tell you that, you know, the first reaction that we all want to do is to go there immediately into the stall and help the horse. And the client has that expectation as well. So it's important to take a step back. Oftentimes in a horse where you suspect an infectious disease and before you go in there and contaminate everything, Get your things ready. Get all your materials ready so you don't need to contaminate your truck. Um, ask some historical questions of the owner. So I try to ask all these different questions where I try to figure out if I think this horse has infectious disease or not before I get there into the stall. Now, are there little dogs running around and little animals running around that we want to potentially contain before we bring out potentially this infectious horse? Another critical control point that I encounter a great deal is discovering the horse you are examining may have an infectious disease. I often have veterinarians and horse owners telling me, oh, you know, 
there's no point in doing the isolation now or there's it's too late now to institute biosecurity protocol. This horse has been in this barn this entire time exposing everyone to this potential disease. And I can tell you that you can still do a lot of good by isolating that horse right away. So as soon as I know that this horse has an infectious disease, I'm likely to then gown up, put on my gloves, you know, act as if I always knew basically, you know, put on all the personal protective equipment, make sure I disinfect everything. From that moment on, that horse is isolated. And this is important because in, depending on the disease, sometimes the shedding is greatest when they are sickest when they're seeing you. So potentially they've gotten through all this time before that without shedding and infecting anyone. But definitely it's still important, even if the horse was mingling with everyone before, to institute biosecurity protocol. Another control point I want you to think about is how to respond when you get phone calls for frantic clients and people at the barn after one of these situations has occurred. So I'd say my more, most frequent challenge in terms of communication would be when, you know, we have a horse with suspect strangles and we recommend some sort of quarantine of the barn. Oftentimes there is some concern due to a, a barn being an active show barn or an active barn where people leave and come. And I'd say my most um, effective way of dealing with those situations is to provide something in writing to the barn manager so that they can explain everything and the procedures I've recommend have, have been formalized. And then, you know, talking about client confidentiality basically with my horse owner and asking how much they want me to divulge um, to people at the barn. And a lot of times this is going to be none at all, and a lot of times this is going to be a somewhat generic statement. Now I'd like to move on to our veterinary biosecurity response in times of an outbreak. So our first step is often to establish different access zones of isolation. This means categorizing, categorizing horses into high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of times horses have been moving about, they've been potentially spreading disease before you find them. So we would clearly isolate the index case and then horses who are in direct contact with that horse, for example, its neighbors, would then be restricted as high risk horses and temperature taken twice daily for seven to 10 days. At moderate risk are horses who would be in indirect contact, and those should have their temperature taken twice daily. At low risk would be horses with no contact, but keep in mind even a horse at the other side of the property um, is still at risk due to fomites and vectors potentially, and should then be monitored closely and kept away from the high to moderate risk horses. Now this is a diagram that I created with a mock-up layout of a barn. You can see that there is the main barn here where we have a few horses and a tack room. The red is the index case. The yellow is a contaminated horse, so a high-risk horse. You can see there's a riding arena, hay storage, a manure pile, some pastures. In this pasture, we've got a llama. We've got a mare in full. And these all are shared water troughs here. In blue and in yellow are the feeders. And you can see you've got kind of a lower risk or unknown status horse here in the pasture, sharing a water trough with the mare and foal. And then we've got some various unknown kind of indirect contact horses out here in these pens, uncovered pens that also have shared water troughs and have some hay bales. So I want you to think about, in this case, how you would deal with traffic flow in order to help this barn. And this is how we can help as veterinarians with containing the disease and with infection control. So here I've laid out how we'd like to move traffic. So I've moved some horses here. So I've, starting with the index horse, I've basically quarantined this barn. I've gone ahead and taken a bale of hay and put it in the barn on a different route, and I'm basically going to try to just use the hay that I bring into this barn, 
and the tack room is no longer being used. So we've got a big X on the tack room. Potentially, if you have some people who absolutely need to continue riding, you could disinfect any tack that comes out and create a temporary tack room in the riding arena. We then have moved other horses around. So the mare in full has now moved into a separate pasture with no shared water trough. We also have moved these horses who were in the pens so that we have a stall separating each of them and therefore if one of them gets sick we are likely to be able to contain the disease and we've brought separate hay bales to them. In terms of traffic, if they want to continue riding they potentially can. We're going to map out for them exactly what route they're going to take into the riding arena, avoiding the barn completely. You can see as far as mucking out stalls We've got one path here that goes around the long way to a separate manure pile so that we don't overlap with the rest of the, of the facility. And now you can see that here with the clean horses, we've got their muck um, coming out in a separate pathway to a different manure pile. So these are the types of considerations we need to make when we consider a barn isolated and the type of questions we need to guide our clients through in terms of access management. So basically, how to handle hay waste, hay storage, how to handle waste. Do you allow boarders to keep riding and accessing the tack room and riding arena? How do you handle farm dogs? So I would say I would recommend not allowing any dogs on the property as, at all. And potentially no children as well. If there's salmonella, you know, is it worth the zoonotic risk? Um, and then think about, too, how to handle this from a legal and ethical standpoint and what to do if a client decides to go to a show anyway. Now here's a picture um, from Equestrian Canada that shows an, a completely isolated isolation barn or stall. And so this is ideal is if you're at a horse show to have the ability to set up something temporary that has absolutely no direct contact with anything else. It would be important to have only one person in charge of overseeing this isolation stall to have designated trained personnel. So ideally you would set up something temporary like that in this picture. Now we don't always have access to a facility like that. And so I want to show you how you can potentially use your existing facilities to create what I call a mini isolation. So let's say that our case is here in the second stall that is affected. Now we have a door to the barn over on the right hand side. So I'm actually, typically I would move the horse to the end of the barn, but because the door is right there, I don't want the horse to be right there where you would have to basically walk into the contaminated region before walking in. So here I've set it at the next best location, the second to end stall. Now I've drawn a barrier, and I'll tell you that ideally you would use a physical barrier. For example, I've set this up before using um, traffic red cones and chains that you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, but if, if you can't do that, then simply some red tape or colored tape can suffice. Now this delineates the contaminated area from the clean area. Now I have a foot bath here as a barrier uh, precaution, and you are not allowed to enter in or out without stepping through this foot bath. Now we've got a garbage can. Um, we've got a gown, so a disposable gown. We have disposable shoe covers, and I just threw this over here for the picture, but ideally you'd have um, a, an entire box of disposable foot covers um, somewhere a little distance away. And inside the contaminated region, I have the muck tub and pitchfork. I've got a table and I've got my stethoscope and all sorts of supplies that I'm going to need within the contaminated region. Um, note also that the horse has an individual thermometer. It's taped up inside a container with chlorhexidine in it. Um, and I've also got some hand sanitizer here. So now we're going to run through how what the procedure would be for donning personal protective equipment. 
as well as doffing personal protective equipment as we're going in to see a horse. So this can be important because it's great and all to set up all sorts of quarantine measures, but if nobody does this right, then we can potentially create a false sense of safety and cause greater amounts of contamination everywhere. So this is a video here of how to don personal protective equipment. So first thing is to put on gloves. Now, if you forget to take off your watch or anything else that you need, um, you can potentially cover any jewelry with your gloves. Next, I go ahead and put on my disposable boot covers before stepping in. So that's important. You don't want to cross that line before you have your disposable boot covers on. Now I'm going to step through my foot bath, which ideally contains Vercon or, or other similar disinfectant. And now I've got my isolation gown, which is a level two uh, isolation gown, which has some low level fluid repellency. And I'm going to carefully put that on. And you can see that tying the neck loop up ahead of time can help facilitate putting these on a little easier without contaminating yourself. And now I'm carefully folding everything to kind of protect most of my back and tying my gown up. Now I can take the supplies I need, my stethoscope and thermometer, and go ahead and examine my horse. Now take note that you can use a less flimsy gown if you want. That is, as I said, a level two um, is a yellow medline isolation gown. Um, you can buy coated fabric or polyethylene gowns. Um, so for example, if you were dealing with a, a salmonella case where you expected quite a bit of liquid contamination, you could purchase those from Medline or Life Supply. So the next video is of doffing using single-use equipment. So these are the steps um, for after you've examined the horse how to take off your equipment without contaminating yourself. And this is considering you have single-use equipment. So I place my individual thermometer into its individual receptacle, put away my stethoscope, and then I'm going to carefully take off my gown. So I'm actually going to break the neck loop and holding it at the chest, I'm going to flip it inside out over my arms and I'm using, you can see me flipping the entire gown inside out um, and not, and basically that's to prevent a lot of uh, contamination um, on the floor. And here I'm removing my booties, touching only the outsides of my boots and then stepping into the foot bath. And when I take off my gloves, I'm careful to touch the outsides of the first glove with my hand and with the second glove, I basically uh, inserted my hand into the clean aspect of the glove, took it off, and then used hand sanitizer at the end. And ideally, you would wash your hands as well. I next have a video of how to do this with multi-use equipment. So note that any guideline that you see, um, whether it's AAP or CFIA, will recommend using single-use equipment, and that it is absolutely ideal. However, I want to recognize for those of us who are in private practice that plastic booties cost us at our cost $2 a booty, yellow gowns cost $2 per gown, and can range up to $9 to $15 if using thicker material. So we are probably going to encounter at some point in our career a client that can't afford the extra expense, but we want to maintain some good biosecurity protocols regardless of their financial situation. So just recognizing that this in reality is a situation we may face, um, I've put together a video of how to use the same equipment um, multiple times, uh, noting that this is not going to be ideal. You'll have a minimal level of um, contamination as a result, but it's better than nothing. Um, and also that anytime you see any of this being visibly soiled, so a gown that's visibly dirt or manure stained, um, you would discard that and you would then take a new gown. So here we are. Note that I'm going to be even more careful about the way I take off this gown. So I'm always lifting the contaminated section away from me and using that loop to pull over my head. When I hang this gown, I'm going to hang it carefully so that outsides of the gown face the outsides 
and that way you can also have multiple gowns hanging together. And when I remove this booty, I'm now going to face the contaminated region, which is the foot of it, facing the same way as the other booty, whereas the upper part of that booty is going to face the same way as the upper part of the other booty. And then I take off my gloves in the same manner as before and hand sanitize in the same manner as before. Do you have any questions on donning and doffing and personal protective equipment? Please go ahead and use the chat if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to disinfectants. So I've put together a chart of three of the different types of recommended disinfectants um, from Equestrian Canada. We've got bleach, we've got peroxygen compounds such as Vercon, and we have accelerated hydrogen peroxide um, such as XL. Prevail is another example. So the contact times are listed, about 10 minutes for most of them, 5 minutes for XL. There are pros and cons to both of these different types of disinfectants. So for bleach, it's low cost and effective. For cons, it's corrosive and potentially greatly inactivated by organic debris. I have a question um, in the chat about hair contamination. So you can see in the videos that I showed you, I was wearing pretty minimal uh, personal protective equipment. So really just gowns, booties, and um, gloves. So that would be kind of your standard for kind of your standard infectious disease. If it was equine herpes virus, I would recommend wearing a bouffant cap or other as well. When I deal with cryptosporidium, for example, in calves, I will actually wear a white Tyvek suit, which is completely fluid repellent, booties, gloves, a face shield, and potentially a mask. So it definitely depends on what disease you're dealing with and what level of infection you're expecting and transmission you're expecting from it. I try to use, you know, one that's, you know, we're not going to go all out with a Tyvek suit and mask for each case. And the simple reason is because the more complicated you make your, your biosecurity protocol, the more likely it is you're going to face compliance issues and potential inadvertent uh, contamination just due to the complexity of the procedure. So here I have shown pretty much a simple standard method of personal protective equipment and note that there are different levels that you can use. So hair contamination is definitely a consideration. I think it's lower risk in some cases, higher risk in others, and definitely use what you think um, you can use to that situation, not only for the disease, but also for the types of clients that you're dealing with. You know, are you at a teaching hospital where you have highly trained personnel? Or are you setting up this isolation uh, setting in a barn with all sorts of personnel that are going to be going in and out and you have minimal training you're going to do with them. In those cases, I use as minimal as I can um, to help them. Okay, so our going back to recommended disinfectants, we have bleach. We then have peroxygen compounds such as Vercon. Now that is quite effective with even moderate organic debris, but it does tend to be corrosive. With our accelerated hydrogen peroxide compounds, we have a shorter contact time and it is non-corrosive and effective as well with moderate organic debris. But take note that it is more expensive, so it's probably going to be more so for our situations at teaching hospitals or other um, kind of high-level hospitals that can afford it. So despite the cons of being inactivated by organic material, I would recommend bleach in the majority of cases. It's a preferred disinfectant due to its low cost it's readily, um, it's readily available to horse owners as household bleach, so they can go and purchase more when they need it. And it also has superior efficacy against salmonella. But really, any of these disinfectants would be perfectly OK. As far as disinfection protocols, I again want to highlight the importance of cleaning before disinfecting. So listed out here is the procedure for cleaning out a stall where a horse has been sick. So you would want to clean within four hours of a horse vacating. And this is so that you don't have, you know, manure caking on and biofilm developing and creating kind of a dif difficult situation to disinfect. You then want to clean out the stall completely. 
So um, sweep it out afterwards. You want all the organic debris out. You then want to rinse it. And in this case, you don't want to create more of a problem than when you started. So taking the nozzle off the hose is ideal so that you don't spray particles everywhere throughout the barn and on yourself. You would then scrub using a soap or detergent from top down and be very conscientious too of being thorough. So include hinges, pipes, ledges, pretty much anything that um, you think may be contaminated. There is then a rinse step. So, so far you've cleaned everything out, you've uh, done an initial scrub with soap and rinsed it off. Now is the actual disinfection phase. So now you would disinfect Typically using 1 to 10 dilution of bleach to water, of course you can use any other disinfectant as well. And now allow that to sit for 10 minutes. You would then rinse this off. You would then repeat the disinfect and rinse step a total of three times. So this is for your horses that you know are infectious. So three times with the bleach and water sitting and rinsing. And then you would then allow to dry. And ideally, if you were in a clinic situation, you would then culture the stall for whatever infectious organism it was, such as salmonella, to verify that it's clean before having another horse in there. But of course, um, in a regular barn situation, you would simply give the horse owner this protocol. Now I wanted to include some other sample disinfection protocols. So from my fellowship at UC Davis, this is the protocol that we followed. We disinfected our stethoscopes regularly using alcohol or chlorhexidine soaked wipes. You could also use um, the accelerated hydrogen peroxide wipes. In terms of large animal equipment, we would clean and scrub and soak and um, clean and scrub the item, just as we talked about with the stall, with detergent, and then we would soak in disinfectant before rinsing and drying. So you can soak brushes, hoof picks, lead ropes, halters, and muzzles in bleach um, for one hour maximum, otherwise it will get pretty corrosive. You can do stomach pumps, dose syringes, twitches, stud chains in chlorhexidine solutions. Now your nasogastric tube, as you may recall from the higher instance of 13% salmonella in colic courses, is going to be really important to clean that. It can be somewhat difficult to clean because it's usually filled with a lot of, you know, stomach juice and other things. And so I usually clean the tube first by forcing cotton balls through the tube. And I use a hose for that until I get the cotton balls coming out clean. So usually two to three of them. Now I soak it in chlorhexidine solution for at least three hours. And it won't discolor your tube if you leave it for three hours. I then rinse the tube, but what it's done is it's loosened up a lot of the organic material that's inside the tube. So I then run another cotton ball through the tube um, using the hose again to remove the residual disinfectant and debris. I then hang it to dry. So this is kind of your quick and dirty way of disinfection. Um, at some teaching hospitals, there's the ability to gas these tubes in between horses, but in most of our cases, we're probably going to be cleaning them using a protocol similar to this. Now, do I have any questions on veterinary biosecurity plans or responses in an outbreak? Okay, so the final phase of what we talk about today is the client biosecurity plan. Basically, how can you help your client to prevent infectious disease from spreading? So there's a document from the CFIA, and I'll have a reference to it at the end of the presentation, created in 2016. And the CFIA national standard has seven components to it. One is to develop a facility biosecurity plan. So step A of step one um, is to make a facility diagram. So you would lead your client through how to make a diagram, including traffic routes and storage areas. So that will look a little familiar to you. Um, so that's kind of like the facility diagram I had created earlier. Now you would want your client to identify the risks. This would consider their geographical location, their use of horses, 
and any travel or movement of, of the horses on or off the property. We would then have the client review their management practices. So they could review their daily activities, maybe using that diagram of the facility to help. Now there is a self-assessment tool available. Um, I've included the URL over here. And um, on your right-hand side of your screen, you have some of the questions that are in the self-assessment tool. Step D is to identify biosecurity goals and best practices. So you would then address any gaps between the self-assessment tool and the ideal biosecurity standard. And of course, the client would then use you as a resource. Um, so that's why I wanted to include these links here today. If you're questioned by a client on how to improve their facility, or if you want to help them establish a protocol, you have a reference to it so that you can assist them. Step E is to develop an implementation strategy. And then step F is to point out the fact that all these things are not set in stone. You're going to have continuous feedback, and you're going to be continuously seeking improvement, reviewing the effectiveness, and uh, basically improving your plan. All right, so that was step one of the CFIA Facility Biosecurity Program. Step two is to monitor and maintain animal health and disease response. So the different concepts would be for infection control, such as uh, decreasing exposure to pathogens, like separating new arrivals, high-risk horses, and susceptible horses, and then decreasing susceptibility to disease, to disease through routine preventive veterinary care. So that's, for example, good nutrition, a good parasite control program, a good vaccination pr program. Um, another part of this would be maintaining records and establishing criteria for an ill horse and having a disease response and emergency preparedness protocol. The next step of this would be movement and transportation of horses. Here the recommendation is to have a certificate of veterinary examination, so your health certificate, within seven days of a new horse's arrival. And also making sure that you have records before a new horse's arrival separating these new horses and monitoring their temperature daily, and then having a separate area for visiting horses. For example, having a special area for them to park, having an area for them to clean and disinfect their trailer, and having them bring in separate water buckets and feed bins. It would also be important to keep horses in similar risk groups together. For example, separating mares and foals. Access management is the next section I wanted to talk about. And access management, as we, as we heard earlier, is the use of physical barriers and procedures to reduce transmission of pathogens by people, horses, equipment, materials, vehicles, and trailers. So you would establish zones. So, for example, in a regular barn, you would have two zones, the controlled access zone and the restricted access zone. The controlled access zone is anything that relates to the care and management of horses, but not any area that includes horses being physically in that area. So, for example, that would include uh, where you keep equipment, uh, your storage sheds, your riding arenas, and unoccupied pastures and barns. The idea is that you would restrict entry um, to the controlled access zone. So it wouldn't typically include the office space, reception area, or the house, if you had a house in this uh, facility. So the restricted access zone, it would be an area where you have further restriction, which means limiting the number of entrances or access points, having biosecurity equipment at these points, posting biosecurity signage, and basically segregating areas for new horses and avoiding direct contact between horses. So the restricted access zone is where the horses are. So it's pens, barns, and pastures. Now, number five of the client biosecurity plan is farm and facility management. This includes um, feed, water, and bedding obtaining them from quality sources, storing them properly to avoid exposure to water and pests, um, cleaning and disinfecting stalls before putting different horses in them, 
pasture management, having a good deworming program, rotating pastures, um, spreading manure only after they're, they are fully composted, and then having cleaning and disinfection protocols available for different equipment, um, stalls, vehicles, and avoiding sharing tack and equipment between horses. So biosecurity awareness, education, and training are part of this plan, and also facility location design and layout. And if things are flawed, is there the ability to renovate that facility a little further? Here I have included some resources for you. There are three resources for the client, the CFIA National Biosecurity Standard, which is what we just covered. There is a CFIA National Biosecurity Producer Guide. And then there is a guide created by Equestrian Canada on emergency action planning for the client. Now, as far as resources for the veterinarian, the EDCC, if you're not already signed on with EDCC, either via email or through social media, you can go on the equinediseasecc.org um, website. And there you can sign up for alerts. Basically, everyone networks in this way to know what is happening in terms of outbreaks throughout North America. There's also the AAEP biosecurity guidelines available on the AAEP website. So that brings us to the conclusion of this presentation. To summarize, salmonella can be found in asymptomatic carriers. It is often difficult to detect. It can also be difficult to disinfect from their environment, which is why the cleaning step is so important. All respiratory conditions, including equine herpes virus, may look the same at first. So biosecurity measures are particularly important for them. And regardless of which genotype of EHV you're dealing with, D752 or N752, we would want to institute strict biosecurity for those with neurologic signs. Strangles results in a 21-day quarantine, whereas EHV results in a 28-day quarantine. And you would want to create a biosecurity protocol for yourself, considering all critical control points. Next, you would want some active surveillance and written biosecurity protocols for your practice. And you could direct clients to the CFIA equine standard for biosecurity programs for their facility. This is a list of references used in this presentation if you wanted to do any further reading. And finally, I will take any questions that you have. Okay, someone is asking, do we have access to this PowerPoint? I will refer that to Christy House from Equestrian Canada to see if um, she has any comment on whether they have access to the PowerPoint or not. Great, so you can see the entire webinar will be posted on the Equestrian Canada website, so you will be able to access the presentation. Now I have a question about what vaccine do I recommend for EHV during an outbreak? So my personal standpoint is to not vaccinate during an outbreak because of the potential um, immune um, responses in EHV. Um, however, you know, every practitioner practices differently. And so some may choose to do it um, according to the consensus statement for EHV. Um, there have no, not been any um, reports of significantly greater disease in case of vaccination during an outbreak. So I don't think it's a wrong thing to do. I just don't tend to do it. Um, but vaccines you could potentially use. Um, you know that there are three types of recommended vaccines by AAP to prevent potentially EHV-related viremia. So there's um, Rhinimmune, the modified live Rhinimmune. There's Prodigy and um, Prestige, so the ones that are um, used for to prevent abortion in mares because they're meant to prevent viremia. They can theoretically prevent uh, neurologic disease from happening. And then there is the inactivated Calvenza flu rhino um, that is a high antigen load um, vaccine and potentially due to the three boosters that you give when you're um, initiating that vaccine 
um, you know, that potentially has greater effect than some of the other killed vaccines. So those are the three types that are recommended during uh, prevention using vaccination. And so I'd say your safest bet if you're using vaccines during an outbreak would be to use one of the killed vaccines, probably not the modified live in case of overstimulation, but, but potentially one of the recommended killed vaccines. Um, I also have a question um, address if I can address practical daily footwear protocols for owners riding at multiple barns. Um, that's a great question. I think ideally we'd have separate footwear for each barn. Um, you know, sometimes we'll make our students do that. I recognize that's not always practical for everyone. So if they can't do that, then potentially if they can wear a muck boot or something that's easily disinfectable, then they could clean their boots in between barns would be ideal. Please let me know if you have any additional questions um, from, from my answers. Um, I've got another question. Do you have any advice for vets encouraging their clients to build a biosecurity protocol in advance of an outbreak? I'd say kind of having a discussion with your clients um, ahead of time before a problem happens would be ideal. So what I often do is I mention something in the news that they may have heard of before, like an EHV outbreak that's happening at a major horse show or, you know, kind of if strangles is going around the area, I'll kind of mention, oh, you know, with the strangles outbreak that's happening, you know, in whatever town um, and basically bring the relevance back to them. So kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the presentation um, about the relevance and significance of biosecurity. Ours was a little bit more of a veterinary related um, significance of biosecurity, but tomorrow we have a webinar for clients by Dr. Ashley Whitehead from the University of Calgary, and she will be presenting on some of the significance of biosecurity to horse owners. So I'd say potentially, you know, bringing it home um, to those owners um, using that kind of material. Now I have another question on how long should you stand in the Vercon foot bath? That's a good question because contact time is technically 10 minutes for Vercon. However, I don't know anyone who actually stands in a foot bath for 10 minutes. So what we usually do is we just walk through the foot bath um, and we expect that, especially if we're wearing a muck boot or something that has um, smooth surfaces, that the Vercon is gonna stay on there. So you're just not going to rinse it off. Um, the only negative thing about this is I have lost quite a bit of footwear to Vercon um, in the past and so have a lot of people that I know. So that's the only negative thing is um, you would either have to leave it on um, without rinsing it off or you'd have to wait 10 minutes before rinsing it off. Um, just note that Vercon is potentially corrosive. Um, okay, I have one more question. Do you recommend testing both blood and nasal swabs for EHV? Um, the answer is yes. So you have higher sensitivity based on one of the diagrams I showed earlier of catching both the viremic phase and the shedding phase if you test both blood and nasal swabs for EHV. Um, the problem then is probably going to be about money and resources. Um, so certainly balance, you know, the gold standard with what your client can afford.